Good morning to everyone. Uh, can we start? Excellent. So, good morning to everyone. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate everyone for being so early here <laughs> after a lot of parting, especially last yesterday evening for many of us. <laughs> so, congratulations for being here and uh, welcome to this session on. Um, a new generation of platform regulations. My name is Luca Belli, I'm professor at FGV Law School, and together with my colleague, Professor Yasmin Kursi, we are going to moderate this session of today, where we are going to speak about a new generation of platform regulations. And let me just provide a little bit of uh, insight on why we have organized this session and what is the uh, goal what are the goals of the discussion we are going to have today before I leave the mic uh, to Yasmin to moderate the, the session. The, 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 let's say that the consensus we, I think we, we are see, starting to see is that there is a need to regulate platform, but what the, the point on which there is no consensus yet and is how to do it in an effective way. Uh, so what we have been doing over the past years is to really to study a lot uh, platform responsibilities uh, in the context of this coalition that gathers every year since 2014, actually. So we actually we, have, we are almost 10 years old. Uh, happy birthday uh, next year. Uh, and we, we have been understanding that there is an incredible impact of online platforms, not only on our life as users of platforms, but also on, on markets, on democracies, and this enormous impact on human rights, on democratic processes, on cons market concentration, may represent systemic risks. So we have been, we have noticed the emergence of several type of regulatory approaches that aim at tackle these risks, uh, these systemic risks. Uh, we have uh, in a paper that we are going to uh, launch today, we have tried to identify trends on these uh, emerging regulatory frameworks, especially analyzing four different uh, approaches, to some extent similar, but with important differences. Uh, these four approaches are, of course, the European uh, DMA and DSA that everyone now is quite acquainted with the uh, Indian IT uh, rules, the uh, Chinese recommendations on algorithmic, uh, sorry, Chinese regulation on algorithmic recommendations, and the uh, Brazilian so-called fake news bill. Uh, why we have chosen these four uh, frameworks? Because together they cover half of the world population. Almost 50% of the world population lives in either Europe, China, India, or Brazil, so they are the most influential ones. But of course, they are not necessarily the best ones. They, it's just it has been a, a choice only to try to have to focus a little bit the the, the study and the discussion while uh, still covering a large portion of the world population. Uh, I don't think that uh, I will enter into the details of the study. I will just leave the, the, the mic to Yasmin to start introducing our uh, discussion and our distinguished speaker. So please, Yasmin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Luca. First of all, I'd just like to thank you all for being here. And also, uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this coalition. I think with this, uh, this uh, outcome is actually a reflect reflection of the, be the best possibilities of like joining uh, people from p several parts of the world to draft uh, to write about their experiences of, of their uh, from their standpoint to uh, about their these initiatives of their countries regarding co uh, content moderation platform regulation etc so I think this uh, collab collaborative work that's going to be soon uh, in our page at uh, the IGF website, and I'm very pleased with the, the final outcome of it, and I hope that you enjoyed the paper, and also if you have any feedbacks once you read, ones that are interested in reading it, 
please send us emails and also if you are interested in joining the coalition, those who aren't part of it yet, please feel free also to get in touch with me and Luca. So without more <laughs> further ado, we have uh, several people and short time here. Uh, I would like to introduce first Samara Castro, who is joining us from Brazil uh, on Zoom. She's the director for the promotion of free speech at the Special Secretariat for Social Communication from the Brazilian government. Samara is here with us. Do we have Samara online? If we don't, maybe, maybe we can go directly to the next speaker. Yeah, while I think she... Is she online? Yes. Samara Castro is on Zoom? Yes. Oh, can we ask, can we, uh, can we ask her to, to speak? Is she hearing us? Hi. Oh, hello. You can hello. Hear hello. Hello. I'm sorry. My internet is very terrible today as my English. <laughs> so I try to share a little um, of information about Brazil. Um, now it's night in Brazil, so it's very different to, to Japan, but I tried to share some information. Well, I hope you are doing well. I want to give you a quick overview of what we'll be discussing in my upcoming talk about how social media is regulated in Brazil. Uh, maybe if my internet don't work, uh, please advise because I can... It's working perfectly. Yes. I can hear you very okay. well. The current state of social media regulation efforts in Brazil, we are. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's let's um, try maybe to uh, proceed with the next speaker and say, while we fix Samara's connection. Yes. So let me uh, introduce. Tatevik Gregorian from uh, UNESCO. That's, and as you, we all know, UNESCO has been also leading an international effort on uh, defining guidelines on uh, platform regulation. So please, uh, Tatevik, the floor is yours. You have a mic, otherwise you can use mine. Let me ask you to, to pass the, along. Oh, okay, there is one here. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for having me here. I know that you would probably expect me to go into the details of the um, guidelines for the governance of digital platforms, uh, but uh, and it is true that uh, we're finalizing the guidelines. Um, uh, uh, but I would I would not like to go into the details of the guidelines for the moment. There have been. Uh, very wide open consultations uh, held globally for months. Uh, uh, so I'm sure many of you are aware. Um, instead, I would like to talk about uh, another framework uh, which uh, which is kind of a step before the um, regulation or go uh, governance of the um, internet and, and online platforms. Uh, so I would like to talk the, uh, then about the um, uh, concept of internet universality, UNESCO's official posi position on on the internet. Um, well, social media is based uh, on the internet and social platforms. So. Basically, UNESCO's position is that internet should be universal globally um, and uh, should be based on uh, four principles and uh, five categories of indicators, which is uh, what we call ROMEX. Um, ROMEX uh, stands for uh, internet that is based on human rights, open to all, accessible to all, 
uh, governed by multi-stakeholder participation and addresses uh, cross-cutting issues such as gender equality, uh, safety and security online, uh, children's rights, uh, sustainable development, and um, environment. So these are um, uh, these are basically indicators. A set of indi uh, 303 indicators where with uh, 109 core indicators, which uh, which allow uh, the stakeholders and governments and other stakeholders to to use these indicators to measure the development and the state of the digital environment based on these uh, indicators and have an, a, a holistic understanding of the digital platform at the national level and make informed policy recommendations. So uh, in this, uh, wh when we talk about regulating or go governing um, uh, platforms, we talk about uh, we see um, the need to address uh, issues such as, for example, well, we talk about human rights, such as rights um, to f for freedom of expression or access to information or the right to privacy or um, open uh, open content open data and many other other issues and these are issues that are, that are addressed um, in this framework um, and uh, and this framework, the, the use of this framework really helps the, the countries to have this uh, comprehensive un understanding and, um, uh, and inform their uh, regulatory process or uh, digital uh, transformation strategies and uh, laws. Uh, so I would here also like to highlight the fact that this process uh, is participatory um, and has this multi-stakeholder approach, uh, so um, which is essential for governing the digital environment, digital pro uh, platforms. Um, it brings together civil society, governments, um, academia, and private sector, and initiates dialogue, dialogue throughout the process, but hopefully also after the process, thus allowing the, the uh, stakeholders, which would otherwise not necessarily be involved in this process of creating all these guidelines, um, giving them an opportunity to have their voice uh, um, in in uh, formulating these uh, recommendations and later on in uh, implementing those recommendations, um, uh, this um, well uh, around the world, forty countries are currently implementing uh, the th this framework, and many have had uh, um, a serious uh, impact, a positive impact, and actually Brazil is um, one the first country that implemented it and very successfully and uh, um, and uh, some of the recommendations were then late, later on reflected in uh, um, in the national law um, and same for for example uh, countries in Africa for example after this uh, uh, Senegal created observatory of uh, internet activity for example or put in place uh, a law linking rights to the internet and many other examples across the world um, and as I spoke about Africa I was just discussing with uh, with uh, our technical advisor Simon here uh, um, on the internet universality Romex indicators that very often um, uh, we hear from the countries that uh, uh, they take up the international regulations, but uh, the local context um, and try to adapt, but the local context is not ne necessarily uh, taken into consideration when it comes to just adopting the international um, European, for example, acts. Uh, but the, the framework, uh, the Internet Universality Romex framework gives an opportunity to take into the consideration the local context, having uh, local uh, contextual, for example, indicators and cross-cutting indicators and really uh, give uh, the chance of, um, 
seeing uh, seeing the local context and also taking into consideration potentially cultural uh, aspects of uh, of the um, uh, of the state um, and also another point uh, which could be relevant uh, for uh, uh, for the topic of the discussion so this um, the framework also can provide a potential way of monitoring the impact and uh, implementation of uh, an impact of the uh, regulatory frameworks that uh, can be put uh, in place, giving the opportunity of um, uh, of uh, conducting uh, the monitoring assessments uh, before the uh, after the the frameworks are put in place, uh, having already uh, given the holistic uh, overview of uh, of the state of the play. So I'll stop here um, uh, and happy to contribute further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tativik. I'm going to check if uh, Samarakashu is available again. Um, okay, let's proceed then. Yeah, I oh. think I think oh, I'm cool. available yeah. okay. now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's so Samarakashu, <laughs> the floor is yours. I'm both ha happy and honored to be here. Um, today, I'm in to share a comprehensive view on the regulation of social media in Brazil. Firstly, it's pivotal to understand the current landscape of social media regulatory efforts in our nation. We, we occupy a very uh, important places in the next few years. We are leading the G20, we are heading the UN Security Council. We are presiding over the BRICS. We are chairing the COP30. So despite the challenge like an attempted coup or an increase in school violence, Brazil has survived and has taken of these important rules. This is our chance to take significant steps forward and inspire other nations. So it's important to point out what the different brands of power are doing in this debate to manage online platforms. Of course, I'm speaking as a, as a government, as an executive of this administration. So the legislative branch is discussing two bills, two, kill, two bills, two different bills, the bill 2630 and the bill 2370. Oh. The Bill 2630 covers online platforms' duties, include transparency, responsibility, um, duty of care, um, risks, systemic risks. Uh, on the other hand, the Bill 237, which grew out of the first, deal with the controversial topics like copyrights and supporting journalism. In the executive brand, we are focused on three areas. We focus and contribute uh, to this proposed bill, create a policy to support diverse and sustainable journalism. This involves guidelines for advertising, ensuring that public funds don't support misleading or harm content or maybe disinformation. Since the government is the major advertising in Brazil, we want to lead by example. Uh, we are to develop a plan to combat false information about health policies and vaccines. Our approach to handling this information, this information starts with vaccine topics. This is unique. We aim to use this method to talk other issues too, uh, like uh, this information about science, this information about uh, the institutions and things like that. We orchestrate a comprehensive range of actions that the executive brand can systematically undertake to examine and counteract the anti-vax movement. We've established communication strategy, mobilize resource for incident response, and soft collaboration with tech platforms to leverage their cap capabilities, enhance the government's outrage to the public. Lastly, we instruct public apps to provide accurate information. We also ensure these apps to 
maybe have a zero rating guarantee that has our essential features and integrity by design. We plan many steps for the executive brand to look into and fight against the anti-vax movement. We've made plans to talk to people, brought together tools to handle problems, and work with tech companies. This is a, a very uh, different and a, a very different plan. In reference to the judiciary brands, they are evolving complex cases related to the platform responsibilities. These cases this case have the potential to reshape the, interpre the interpretation of the internet civil framework. The goal is to reconsider how platforms are held accountable for the content they are host. Moreover, the electoral court has set up a task force to combat misinformation on these platforms. In conclusion, Brazil is deeply committed to forcing a safer and more transparent and accountability internet, while also asserting our digital sovereignty and ensuring information integrity. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for my English and my connection. And I stand ready to delve deeper into the subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samara, for the very uh, deep overview in only five minutes of all the initiatives, the many initiatives that Brazil is, uh, tr is trying to lead and is trying to implement. And I guess that everyone here uh, might have noticed, especially those who participate to IGF, uh, that actually somehow Brazil is back. Uh, people have noticed over the past year that there was a sort of withdrawal of Brazil from the international scene and I think it's quite evident this year that there is a comeback of uh, a lot of Brazilian initiatives and Brazilians <laughs> around. Uh, one of these initiatives has also of Brazil has been recently also to join the partnership on information and democracy that uh, Michael Bach, this is here with us, is uh, leading and chairing. And I have the honor also to be one of the members of the steering uh, committee of the observatory. So Michael Bach, uh, please, the floor is yours to tell us a little bit more about what the partnership is uh, trying to do. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, th thanks for the introduction. It's great to be here. I'll uh, spend a few minutes just to talk about what uh, my organization does and why it's relevant to uh, the development of new regulations to check uh, big tech and hold them to account. Uh, the, I'll go back a couple of years to 2019 when a dozen or so democracies came together under the International Partnership for uh, Democracy and Information. Uh, they came together uh, to establish a set of principles that would guide some of their commitments to ensure that technology serves our democratic institutions and uh, ensures credible information, which is a key cornerstone of uh, democracies. Today, with, the, uh, with Brazil joining as the 51st uh, partnership member in August, it's a pretty robust group of democracies uh, that ebb and flow <laughs> over, the, over the years, as we've seen in some democracy index. But that partnership uh, provided a mandate to create the Forum on Information and Democracy which is a civil society-led initiative to implement uh, some of the key priorities. And we do this in generally uh, two large buckets. On the one hand, uh, there is the development of policy recommendations uh, and then submitting those to governments, to civil society, and companies as well to, to utilize and integrate. Uh, we do this through uh, a process that gathers experts within academia, research backgrounds, civil society, a range of disciplines and experiences to, uh, through working groups on key issues. And we've done one issue a year over the last four years, from infodemics to algorithmic transparency to the future of journalism. And we're about, we're just kicking off a new round on the impact of artificial intelligence on democratic institutions. These, uh, uh, through these networks of uh, researchers and academics, we're able to, to one of the points made earlier about 
uh, understanding uh, local nuance, and importantly, the downstream impact of regulations that may work in the north and may be, have very different implications uh, in the global south. Uh, and so it's very important for us, I think, to incorporate those voices, and this process is a good way of doing that. By way of example, uh, one of the first uh, processes that we undertook, led by Maria Ressa, on the infodemics, upwards of 60 of the recommendations made their way into the DSA. And I think it's a good example of a process that contributes to that. Now, another area that our organization works on is what Luca is involved in, uh, the observatory. This is one of the key missing pieces as we address information integrity. Uh, the aim of the observatory, much like the um, ICCPR for uh, climate change, uh, is to establish a common understanding of the facts, of what the latest scientific evidence indicates uh, is the impact of these technologies on our democratic institutions and information, which is so Im importantly and inc incredibly important to that. So the observatory uh, was developed over the course of a year, uh, driven by Shoshana Zabouf and um, the former chair of the OECD. And now we're realizing that plan with a steering committee of eminent experts from around the world, from all continents, uh, to drive uh, working group discussions on key areas uh, in this first round this year. And uh, that will then result next year with a report and hopefully some dynamic way to interact with the, the information. All this to say is it's, a, a, I think, a really interesting process by which there is a connection between government and regulators and with uh, civil society and academics and researchers from uh, around the world that results in some concrete change. And because of the, this sort of coalition of democracies, we have an opportunity to work with them on providing technical assistance to understand the recommendations, how they might be operationalized, recognizing that some countries have much more resource and capability to do this than, than others, you know, where you might have a parliamentarian in one country that has a staff of 10 people, and in another, you're lucky if you have someone who can help with your scheduling. Uh, and so that's what makes it uh, really interesting and really powerful. So thank you for the, the, the floor to be able to explain that. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, now I would like, I'd like to call uh, Professor Hof Webe, who is on Zoom with us. Uh, he's a professor of the University of Zurich and we'll talk about uh, DSA, and, sorry, DMA, uh, the Digital Markets Act. Professor Rolf Weber is here with us. Yes, uh, good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much for the invitation to um, contribute to this uh, discussion at a very uh, specific time, namely uh, two in the morning. I have um, uh, decided to uh, particularly talk about, let's say, more academic aspects of uh, platform regulation, because uh, I'm of the opinion that there is a need uh, to dig more deeply uh, into potential checks and balances uh, mechanisms, which uh, could uh, provide a better legal and normative framework for platform regulation. And uh, therefore, I would like uh, to address two uh, pillars which have not been discussed uh, deeply in the past, namely accountability and particularly uh, observability. As everybody knows, accountability encompasses the obligation of one personal legal entity to give account of and explain and justify the undertaken actions or decisions to another person in an appropriate way. In the past, we often discussed transparency, but uh, accountability also look, looks at the back side of the metal, at the responsibility uh, side. Accountability concerns itself with power, and power implies responsibility. And this is an assessment 
which in fact has been considered by the EU uh, Commission with uh, the two um, uh, recent uh, acts which have been released, namely uh, the DMA and the DSA. The DMA looks at market structure and uh, tries to avoid that monopolistic approaches uh, can be combated at least to a certain extent. DSA more um, addresses uh, contractual uh, terms, behavioral aspects of contractual uh, relations. And uh, the DSA uh, also uh, looks at the question to uh, what um, extent platform providers can be obliged to provide information in a timely manner, how standards can be uh, introduced that hold uh, governing uh, uh, bodies uh, accountable, and to what extent uh, sanctions uh, can be uh, implemented. So uh, DMA and uh, DSA, in a more uh, academic uh, perspective, are at least partly tackling the uh, opening uh, the black uh, box problem of algorithmic uh, decision making. I'm of course not uh, arguing that uh, DMA and DSA are really perfect regulations. However, I do think that uh, they have done a uh, first step in to the right uh, direction, even if a first uh, very recent uh, court uh, decision has um, supported Amazon's position that uh, some specific uh, provisions uh, would indeed not be applicable to uh, Amazon. Just to complete uh, this first part of my short uh, intervention, I think that accountability should also be supported by the concept of auditability uh, being an institutionalized mechanism for the verification of platform information of platform data. So far, Europe has not really much uh, advanced. Uh, a lot uh, could be done um, in this field and uh, academic uh, research uh, is available how the uh, auditability principles could be implemented. My um, second uh, pillar of discussion would be the concept of observability as a pragmatic way of thinking about the means and strategies necessary to hold platforms accountable. While observability incorporates uh, partly in a similar way as transparency, it also deviates most importantly by understanding accountability as a complex, dynamic, social um, relation. Observability should become a mechanism that can overcome the lack of sensitivity for fundamental power imbalances, strategic occlusions, and false binaries between secrecy and openness. The challenges raised by platforms as regulatory structures need to be addressed more broadly, uh, as I have uh, mentioned, beginning with the question of how large-scale transnational environments that heavily rely on technology as a mode of governance can be uh, assessed. Insofar, the DNA has introduced uh, gatekeeper obligations and practice will show to what uh, extend these uh, legal obligations can be made fruitful uh, in uh, daily life. At least basic rules exist uh, now on how people need to be treated on online platforms, how connections between participants are made and structures, and which outcomes should be um, achievable. Let me uh, just um, um, finish uh, my short uh, intervention by saying that uh, the principle of observability could also reflect 
some kind of acknowledgement that the volatility of platforms requires a continuous uh, observation. And insofar, the concept of observability should be based on public interest as a normative horizon for assessing and regulating the societal challenges of platformization. In the context of the public sphere, public interest encompasses the protection of human rights, such as freedom of expression and freedom of information, fostering cultural and political diversity throughout the whole society. Only a broadly understood concept of public interest as a normative benchmark could reasonably regulate platform behavior and realize also targeted transparency. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rolf, uh, for uh, this brilliant exposition of the, these key elements of DMA and DSA, uh, DSA, sorry, particularly, and also providing a little bit of overview of DMA. Um, now let's give the floor to Anita uh, Gurumurti, uh, Executive Director of IT for Change, to uh, switch from Europe through India and to start to understand a little bit what are the uh, key problems that we really need to address with regulation. Please, Anita, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Luca and Yasmin. With your permission, I'll focus a little bit on India, maybe towards the end, but broadly posit, you know, what um, the work that my colleagues and I do really, um, you know, kind of uh, reflects over the past few years. And I really, really like the idea of focusing on a new generation of uh, platform regulation. And I think the focus very much should be from a certain individual human rights centric approach to a larger structural uh, societal democracy approach. And that would include, in my argumentation, the whole idea of economic democracy as well. And so the first part of what we should look at, I think, is a broad sweep. I think uh, uh, if the raison d'etre for, I don't know whether I pronounce it correctly, there are French people in the room, I don't know, <laughs> is about a future of society uh, in digitalization, I think we need to look at concerns that are also international and global. So the debate needs to be reframed not only for how rights are mediated by data, AI, and platform technologies, what it means for individuals, but also globally how interconnections um, between international economic law, social media regulation, and the way internet platforms work shapes certain things like international trade agreements that then prevent local autonomy of the public and public authorities to scrutinize algorithms. So in the global south, if you're part of the IPEF in Asia, for instance, you know you might not be able to exercise. It's not about data localization. I'm talking really about the ability of public authorities to, you know, municipal authorities to say, okay, if this is where there was harm, then how do you open up and scrutinize where the harm really was? And this really not only undercuts uh, consumers, but also workers, for instance, you know, in terms of um, warehouse workers of Amazon who are forced to wear, uh, you know, these uh, gadgets, you know, during uh, their work. Then there is the sovereignty agenda, which of course everybody understands because we are really talking about a geopolitical issue where global strategic competition has really, really become contingent today on in information warfare. So. This is a, a quite a large issue, I think, of human societies not being, uh, you know, given the same rights. And therefore, I would, in fact, argue that this is not about internet fragmentation, but it is about the division of societies into those who have rights and those who don't have rights. Uh, of course, no one is sacred here at all. All of us are data points. But I uh, wanted to say that one of the research... Uh, Systematic researches that we undertook a couple of years ago on femtech and menstrual apps really showed us how the GDPR is applied to uh, women in Europe very differently and how uh, training data sets are actually coming from women in the global south who download European apps. So what we're actually seeing is a fragmentation that is completely untenable because uh, we don't even know where to go to contest these rights because these are cross-border uh, issues, you know, servers located somewhere else and bodies located somewhere else. So I think uh, with regard to social media, I would like to say that the way visibilities and invisibilities are very selectively mobilized, you know, it's not about making something ephemeral and making something very, very pronounced, but actually using this in, in terms of uh, 
the way this uh, state corporate nexus works, which we are all very familiar with. And the way in which this actually happens is really at the heart of the matter. And um, this, I think, uh, is very, very antithetical to the way diversity narratives are mobilized by big tech, you know. Uh, uh, and completely what you see is uh, an unaccountable regime of misogyny there. So what I would like to say is that we should explore less explored theories like democracy and social choice theory, like, for instance, how uh, a collective can shape its own um, social preferences and collective preferences um, and rank certain priorities. For instance, yesterday I was at a session where uh, somebody from a community media organization in Canada was bemoaning the fact that hundreds of local media are disappearing every day. So what does this actually mean in terms of structuring, uh, not just the regulation of platforms, but structuring society for digitalization in a certain way. And that really is about the idea of freedoms not only as individual choice, but idea of freedoms as the structures that determine individual choice. So uh, quickly, I want to just ju jump on. And since uh, the Digital Services Act has been mentioned, I want to point that one of the key weaknesses that we see uh, is that while it talks about mitigation measures, while it um, uh, really talks about uh, uh, the possibility that duty of care can be placed on platforms, one missing piece is that you can only take on an individual company. You, as an individual, you can take on an indi uh, individual company. As a group, you can take on an individual company. But it's simply not possible for you to take on an industry. You cannot take on um, this kind of architecture of impunity that exists out there. And I think that's really a, a problem, because you can say that my uh, human rights were affected because harms were per perpetrated on me. But in each case, the cost to company is nothing. You, know, you just settle and go away when you're paying fines. Google has been paying fines in the European Union for kingdom come, right? So this is actually a question of corporate culpability and liability. And uh, insofar as we keep uh, shadow boxing, I think we're not going to get anywhere. And all this talk about altruism of big tech is a completely futile exercise in the form of self-regulation and ad hoc exposed individualistic me measures that really don't address integrity, informational integrity. So we do really need to look at things that in the AI Act, for instance, I think that's a very good, uh, again, a European um, invention. I think what we need to really do is look at proactive uh, public disclosures. I think proactive public disclosures of the technical parameters of how did you build the code, you know? And these are not necessarily breaking open trade secrets. What you're doing is essentially, you know, uh, knowing the unknowable, and also pricing open this myth of the unknowable. And I think that that's what we really need to do. And uh, that is where I think the AI Act, you know, when it is in force and when it uh, is operational, we'll see some uh, improvements. Finally, I just want to talk about media pluralism. And I think that as a civil society organization, it's important to understand this um, kind of, um, you know, um, rating and ranking that's done by this criterion called relevance. I'm supposed to watch a film because it's relevant to me. You know, So uh, it's, it's not just about the cultural rights around serendipity, but I think it's really about the information diet that is being provided to everybody. Uh, you know, Collapsed under this catchphrase called relevance is not going to work because this is about the enormous power and profit motives of internet uh, platforms, which provide us this paradox of choice. And pluralism might have us thinking about you know, the equivalence of public interest media as to why must I only watch things that I want to watch. I should be subjected, I think, to things that I'm uncomfortable watching, uncomfortable listening to. It's a very contentious content-related debate, no doubt. And I, I do understand these problems. But it's like uh, we all grew up in India on a diet of uh, you know, it, the, there being just one channel on television. And we had to watch things about the issues farmers faced. Although I was a creature of urban India, I had to understand those things. You know? And that's because you live in a diverse society. I want to close uh, with the Indian IT Act. I, uh, less said about it, the better. But I think uh, we've been through several iterations. And the one that's most concerning is um, a 2023 amendment uh, to the rules, which was notified by the ministry, which authorizes a fact-checking unit of the central government uh, to identify content online in respect of any business 
that the central government might deem fake, false, or misleading, and uh, the unilateral uh, rights and powers of the state to actually take th this content down by approaching internet service providers. Of course, civil society has protested. Some people have protested uh, more vehemently, but many of us are all not, not able to protest. And I think um, I'll leave it there because I think we are talking about the state of democracy. And um, I suppose we need to read between the lines. Thank you so much, Anita. And thank you all from the first panel uh, for this such enlightening uh, conversation that we are having here. I think we are able to see the main challenges of regulating platforms nowadays. Uh, also, I'd like to highlight that in our uh, outcome this year, we have um, another frame framework proposal for policymakers, this time focusing on a uh, much uh, more international approach to it. Uh, and last year, as Rolf uh, uh, highlighted in his uh, uh, speech also, uh, we had another framework regarding transparency and accountability for platforms. So if any anyone is interested in these topics, also access our website, at, uh, our page at the IGF website. These documents are available there. So I'd like to open for Q&A as we are super punctual today. Uh, we have 10 minutes for questions. If anyone here in the room would like to pose one. Okay. We have, we have already two. So oh, we, I I just introduce yourself. Uh, yes. And I think Please we can take two or three. Yeah. And then yes, three. So we have one, two, and let's three. Let's try to keep in two, two minutes, sure. if possible. Um, yeah, so um, this is uh, Handan Oslo from Turkey's Internet Observatory and The Observant. So we are, uh, first, to thank you all for your talk. It was very inspiring. Um, so I, I would like to give a quick example of how internet, uh, actually, big tech accountability can be an issue. In, um, some certain countries where there is not enough of incentive to actually protect citizens sometimes. So in Turkey, we are conducting investigations on malpractices of big tech companies, and we find mass, mass fraudulent activities using AI and micro-targeting in which two million Turkish citizens are impacted. And we report on this, that there is, you know, Facebook is earning money out of scammers, phishing attacks, and nothing really happens because there is no mechanism, there is no political climate, there is no incentive mechanisms to hold Facebook accountable in every single country. It's on the hierarchy of needs, people do not think that digital issues and digital problems are that important. So what happens right now with DMA and DCA is that a safe internet is another global north privilege at this point. So um, so we, find we have a lot of findings where we prove algorithmic biases, we prove uh, lack of uh, content removal, we prove information operations, and all of those investigations, but on top of it, if you are in a functioning democracy or in a, a certain other context, you know, there are certain mechanisms in place to support actually platform accountability. So um, my question would be, uh, if, if your country is re le leading and is honest in terms of protecting citizens, how do you think you can leverage your power and your know-how to actually support other countries, uh, just so this issue doesn't become, um, again, a privilege? And um, secondly, my question, um, actually, no, I think, I think this is it for now, and I would like to also um, and the second thing is that all of these regulations are potential to become also guns of authoritarian governments. So this information was something that was uh, meant to be a, a positive thing when it was sold, and now it became a method for authoritarian governments to suppress voices. So any, thing, any governance that any Western country is going to make is going to have a turn, and it's going to somehow be a, a tool. It, it, it might be something about fraudulent stuff, it might be something about child protection. But um, so, how do you think um, you are? Uh, I, I, I mean, my question is are you actually watching how these uh, rules and regulations are transforming uh, and being adapted across different countries in different needs? Otherwise, it's, um, it might be a, a problem as well. So, sorry, that was a bit long. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can we just take the other two questions and then we can have uh, some comments? And I think the gentleman there was the second, yes. Um, so <clears throat> I'm, uh, Tatavec referred to me in her presentation. My name's Simon Ellis. I've been, uh, I've been assessing the, uh, the internet uh, under the Romex uh, system for uh, about 20 countries so far. 
Um, and um, I think the, the basis of the, the UNESCO regulations, which I think is a, a correct one, is there is a balance here. We all want that the internet should not be involved in child abuse and misogyny, and therefore some control from government side is necessary. Um, and especially with the, uh, the, the very large open platforms of VLOPs and the EU, EU legislation, um, and, and on the other hand, we know that um, there should not be too much control, which then becomes a threat to democracy. Uh, the, the second stage then, I think, really is that for many developing countries, they have no idea how to regulate, and they have no idea how to deal with these big countries, as, as Michael Back clearly enunciated as well. So they are adopting these principles, including the European laws, without a sense of knowing what they're doing. And in at least one country, I'm not going to name, but they adopted it, and then just as the legislation was about to come in force, they realized what they'd adopted, and they pulled back, because they realized that that gave consumers rights which actually the government didn't really want to give them. Um, and there are, there are various countries in different stages of this and with different intentions behind it. So I think what the, the, the UNESCO regulations are trying to do is, is create, a, a, as it were, a basic starting point from which countries can negotiate with the platforms and some principles. And I think that helps the companies as well. Um, Meta does not want to negotiate separately through 300 countries in the world about what things are doing, especially with small countries um, currently working, for example, in the Pacific, which have no idea and no resources to assess this kind of thing. So I think there's a balance to be struck here, um, and I don't know how I think that how that will work out. Um, so, in, in a sense, if you like, to turn it into a question, it, it's it's very interesting to see how this would work out, and also I, I think at least that, that there's an offer here through UNESCO. Um, as I've hinted, we can identify through the Romex assessment um, countries to what they need, wh where the gaps are in their legislation, where the human rights problems emerge, um, and then we can at least begin to perhaps point them towards resources which can help them to um, address those kinds of issues. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Andrew Campling. Um, I run a consultancy that, that sort of works in public policy, public affairs, and internet standards, and I'm a trustee of the Internet Watch Foundation. Um, just, just briefly, I, I sh should say first, I accept that probably our perspective on these issues depends on the democratic situation of the countries that we live in. So if we're in a sort of democracy, we'll take maybe one view. If we're not in a d democracy, we'll have other different challenges, um, which makes this quite hard. Um, but just briefly, s some quick points. Um, I think so the, the issue that, that, that we face are largely that privies Privacy is being positioned by many as an absolute right rather than a conditional right. Um, and effectively, it's, we're, we're faced with the challenge of pervasive privacy being used to a, as an attack on accountability and on democracy. Um, and, and I think we need to look at it in, in that way that it's actually been used, it's been weaponized um, by, by the tech companies. Um, so deliberate choices of technology are being made um, to allow for plausible deniability on accountability. So, for example, by choosing to use end-to-end -end encryption um, to hide things like uh, uh, CSAM, um, and then arguing that because a platform's chosen to use end-to-end -end encryption, that when a government demands uh, uh, action on CSAM, that's an attack on encryption. When in reality, it's because of the choice the platform made in the first place, uh, uh, deliberately, um, to give it plausible deniability and to sidestep uh, that, that accountability. Um, of course, the, the, the sector as a whole um, is also trying to show that there's a unific sort of unified position on these topics, mainly through corporate capture of civil society and uh, e you know, an enormous uh, financial power on lobbying um, uh, you know, to, to sort of overpower um, uh, 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 any opposing voices and frankly they're framing the discussion to favour the position of the global platforms um, f for example 
using end-to-end -end encryption and privacy to focus the discussion on government surveillance um, and divert attention from um, surveillance capitalism, um, which I think is really actually quite clever, because I'd argue that the surveillance capitalism is the bigger attack on privacy um, than, than, than government surveillance, at least in democracies, um, accepting it may be different elsewhere. And using internet fragmentation as a topic to justify sort of homogenous implementation on platforms, which is really largely about uh, uh, you know, e efficiency of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, running of the I'm platforms. Yes. Will you wrap up yes. and ask your question? Yeah. Sorry. The, the, the one request I'd make, though, is um, where, uh, given I focus on internet standards, a lot of choices that have been made in internet standards um, make it really hard for regulations to work. Um, and it's a real problem that uh, sort of governments and civil society is largely absent uh, from uh, uh, internet standard uh, sort of fora, uh, and it will be incredibly helpful to have more voices there to, to sort of count, make counter arguments to the uh, sort of tech uh, sector um, to, to give the other point of view. Okay, I, I have the impression that the, all the questions were more comments than questions. So I think we can go, yes, we can proceed with the next phase of the session. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to give the floor for Professor Monica Zaneruti from the University of Sydney and also the Law Institute of the Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences. Please, Monica. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Yasmin and Luca, for um, well hosting and, and moderating this session and, and for having me here. Um, since I don't think we have so much time left, I'll just try to make a few points uh, more generally on the new um, generation of platform regulations, and I think maybe build in some ways of particularly Rolf's uh, comments uh, on uh, on uh, on EU regulation, perhaps, uh, and I. I also coming from EU myself, uh, I think uh, sort of it's, it's good to somehow have a little bit of distance to our own uh, regulatory initiatives that are always um, sort of praised around the world as being the most novel and no most ambitious and so on. So uh, sort of the point I would like to raise is that perhaps the new generation of a a AI and platform regulation is not something really different or new from what we had before. And this, I would argue, comes from a um, very proceduralist focus on a lot of our platform regulations. Um, and what I mean by that is that there's a certain belief that procedures and safeguards in themselves are sufficient to counter uh, the platform power, to, to change the status quo, to, to, to provide safeguards against the abuse and, and the harms that we encounter. So, the belief um, sort of is very strong, um, and it stems, I think, from the from the comparison, popular comparison, comparing the big platform companies to states, where we think the due process, rule of law, and transparency and accountability, these kind of vague rule of law values, uh, would temper public power, and we think that they will do the same. Especially transparency, for example, would would be very effective tool in dealing with platform power, and. I think that then from there, we focus so much on small procedures and audits and checklists and various things like that, that we miss the bigger picture. And what I mean by this is that, for example, the DSA um, uh, really articulates a lot of different procedures, in many ways institutionalizing uh, a lot of uh, private practices that were there already before, uh, but providing a sort of constitutionalizing uh, the whole framework. Um, but what I want to say is that by focusing on procedures so much, we miss the large picture. So for example, we rarely, if at all, and in the session as well, I, I notice we, we don't really discuss, for example, the US dominance or environmental degradation, exploitation of resources, extraction of resources, extract, uh, exploitation of labor on a global scale. We don't really discuss that. So for example, the new AI Act in EU uh, talks about AI only as a finished consumer product. Mm -hmm. yes. Doesn't really talk about environmental issues at all. Doesn't talk about the labor exploitation. There is decolonial um, element in there that really needs to, to be uh, brought to the front, but definitely it's not there. So I think that by focusing so much on all the due process and due diligence and all these various proceduralist, uh, proceduralist uh, sort of 
frameworks. We really, we really don't talk about how our tech companies contribute to the climate disaster and exploitation of um, climate. Uh, sorry, cl uh, contribute to climate change and exploitation of resources around the globe and and so on. Um, and I think that. It's really problematic because focusing on procedures um, that much, as we do in our legal frameworks often, um, it's dangerous because it gives the appearance of political neutrality. Uh, because we focus on procedures, sort of we're doing the right thing. That's how lawyers think, I think. That's how we're trained to think often. Um, so therefore, we're doing the right thing and, and you know, we are politically neutral. Um, and that's really problematic, and I think some people already commented here how uh, various countries are adopting the same approach and so on. But my argument is actually a bit stronger. I think that even though we like to um, frame, for example, US and EU as really being in opposition or opposite ends of the spectrum and so on in regulation, I think in the end it's very similar. Platform companies are actually doing the same thing, both in Europe and in US. And though, yet we claim that, you know, EU is leading its normative power is enormous and so on. So what's the problem? There must be some problem that, in fact, we're somehow legitimizing the, the corporate power, the platform power that is there with all these small procedural rules that are there. And also language, uh, the, the legitimizing um, effect of language, you know, of lawfulness, of constitu constitutional values that are that are, we are using in the private sort of self-regulatory initiatives. And I have a colleague here who's on an oversight board as well, and that's a good example, and we're actually very good friends. So, um, you know, so there is a lot of that sort of legitimizing effect, not only new neutrality, but also legitimizing effect. And I think a lot of the new generation of um, platform regulations does exactly that. It sort of legitimizes the existing order. Um, so I don't want to say that we don't need new... Um, regulation for digital platforms. To the opposite, we do need them. However, I think that the current sort of model that we have, or the current, um, the latest wave of these um, regulations, they don't really challenge the existing status quo, which would be the perhaps somehow intervening with the business model or the legal foundations, how it is structured. We don't do that. Uh, and so I would argue that they actually contribute to the institutionalization of, of the, the, the current order uh, ordered by the big tech companies while promoting a narrative that, uh, you know, uh, we are creating a new predictable and trustworthy online environment. So to change that, we need something else, some more ambitious laws that would tackle the loopholes of the, of the, you know, a lot of uh, different, um, what are they called, I'm sorry, uh, harbor, safe harbor uh, regimes and various other legal provisions like that, that we actually let the um, big tech platforms just do their own thing without ever even sharing what, what exactly that is. So that's it. That will be my short contribution, and I hope to discuss that with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, and also to, to remind us that we need to be critical and that we speak out of about the Brussels effect. Yesterday we had a very good panel on AI when at some point some uh, some participants raised uh, the idea that there is a Brussels effect, but maybe we can we can consider it sometime a Brussels defect because we tend to import regulation, but we don't know if it works. And sometimes we may think that is the best uh, that we have, but is not necessarily the best that we can have. Uh, and so it's much more interesting to be critical. I see there is an hand raised, but we are finishing this, the set of presentation, and then you will be the first speaking. Vittorio Bertola has been working from the uh, technical community and, and private sector perspective on these kind of issues for uh, several years, and he has a unique pers international and European perspective on these issues. So please, Vittorio, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Even if I will deal with the boring uh, procedural things, so uh, yeah. But I think, but I mean, you, what you're saying is very important. The point, the problem is that uh, this, I mean, what we got with the DMA and the DSA is the maximum political reality we can get. So the, the demand by citizens for something more doesn't exist in terms of representation in the European Parliament at the European level. So first, something needs to happen in society before we get. The, the European Parliament on the same line. But, I mean, it's already quite important to get a, a proper implementation of 
the, the laws that we could finally get after 20, uh, 20 years of complete uh, liberalism in internet regulation in the European Union. And especially I wanted to very quickly go through the, what, what, is been, what has been happening with the Digital Markets Act, because again, it's very important to notice how it, this is already slowly being eroded by the platforms. So they find ways so to depotentiate, to re reduce the impact of the law by working at the implementation level. When uh, you know the political attention is gone and uh, there's no, also I mean, the media attention is mostly gone and there's no, I mean, few people that really care and are still watching what happens. So uh, you might know that the, the DMA was approved last year. It basically entered into force in May. And the first step for the DMA was to actually identify the gatekeepers. So you need to get to a list of the companies that are big enough to be regulated under these special rules. So they have at least 7.5 billion in turnover in the European Union, and they have 45 million users. So there's a number of criteria. And so on the, in early September, like one month ago, the commission finally designated the gatekeepers. And, they, and there were already some negative surprises in that. So we got a list basically of six companies, which are, uh, as expected, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, ByteDance, so TikTok is in, Meta and Microsoft. Uh, but there were some glaring omissions. <laughs> so, uh, for example, if you go through the list then of, uh, of the messaging uh, services that, that, are, that are involved, uh, let me get the correct one, but it's just uh, um, WhatsApp Messenger, there's no iMessage, because even if uh, Apple iMessage meets the quantitative thresholds that are set by the law, someone, possibly Apple, and convince the commission <laughs> that uh, maybe it's not so important, or so dominant, or so big, uh, I mean, it's just one third of the European users, so it's not a dominant thing. And so the commission decided to start uh, another investigation and think for six months whether maybe a message could be included or not. And the same thing happens in like uh, other things. So there's, um, and some, some services were completely omitted, especially Gmail, which I mean, I don't know how you can argue that Gmail is not a dominant email service, and email, email is one form of uh, number independent uh, ICS, Internet Personal Communication Service, or Bing. So the only search engine that falls under the new law is Google, because they decided that Bing is, uh, even if it in numbers it's big enough, it, it has a, a very small market share, but still it's big, big enough. And, and so it's, uh, so I mean, uh, the, the point is that uh, you have to care about the implementation and check what's happening and make sure that actually the, the, I mean, the designation covers everything, and we are thinking, we as open source community in Europe, thinking whether we should challenge these in law, but it's completely transparent at the moment. There's no documents, so you cannot read why these decisions were taken, and you cannot even read uh, well, what the, com the uh, companies argued. And, you know, there are some worrying uh, revelations coming out, and this is important in general. You might have, I mean, if you, if you watch the American case by the Department of Justice against Google in, uh, in the advertising industry, I mean, Google just revealed that basically they manipulated the, the, uh, the, uh, the bids for the, for the advertising. So they don't uh, always award the, the advertising to the highest bidder. They have something they call long-term value of the advertiser, which is completely transparent. And so they decide, I price this company more than this other. Even if the other offers more money, I will give the ads to this other one. So they basically manipulate the market, uh, all the digital markets. And in, again, there's no transparency because they say, oh, but this is now done by an AI algorithm, and so we don't know what it does. And we are not able to tell you why it's taking the decisions it takes. And, but, so so it, it's getting worse, actually. AI, as I mean, Andrew first was mentioning encryption as a way not to be accountable, and AI is the new way of not being accountable. And they will use AI everything just so that they cannot be ac accountable. And uh, so uh, finally, the, the only thing I wanted to say is that uh, the implementation only goes uh, also goes through um, technical standardization at the ITF. For example, the, the interoperability for messaging is going through standardization at the ITF. And again, you see all the, the same dynamics in which the big tech companies have a lot of people to send and can influence the result. And if you're not part of this circle of insiders, you can just say something, but you will be possibly ignored. Or like it happened to me yesterday, you will be asked to make your presentation at midnight Japanese time after all the day. So that, and, and of course, you, you're doing other things. You cannot be there at midnight because you just don't have the stamina, maybe. Or you, well, the, uh, the big tech people can send full-time people just for this process and be there at, whenever it's necessary. And so you, you see all these exclusionary factors uh, repeating themselves. And, and we should start watching at the implementation of things and not just uh, at the letter of the laws. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vittorio. Now I'd like to call uh, Professor Alejandro Pizanti, who is on Zoom with us. 
Uh, Professor Alejandro Pizant is from UNAM, Universidade from Mexico. <laughs> is he on Zoom with us? Yeah. Alejandro, thank you so much. Yes, here I am. Is yours. Can you hear me well? Yes. Hi, uh, thanks for inviting me to this, uh, to this session, Luca, Jasmine. It's been very interesting as uh, I, I've been following it partly in text because the uh, magic of IGF scheduling put me into two simultaneous uh, uh, meetings plus one that was past midnight last night, so at 3 a.m. Uh, so I'll be very brief here, very concrete. Uh, I'm going to bring a complementary angle. This is not an opposition to, to what I've heard, but it's rather complementary. Uh, I fear that uh, approaches based on, on uh, let's say, the, 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 the Brussels approach on uh, based on, on laws and more laws and more regulations uh, can have a very limited effect on what we dislike and uh, on what we find harmful that's happening on platforms. Uh, we, it, it goes very much, to, let's say, to the anatomy where the problem is coming from the physiology of things, the way things actually work. Uh, some of what we see, like uh, disinformation, cybercrime, or you know, for some value of the, of the name cybercrime, uh, and so forth, are uh, amplified, uh, made cross borders and so forth by platforms. But in the end, uh, we are not touching the origin of these uh, undesirable and frankly harmful things. So briefly, uh, I think that we should, uh, in parallel, look at things through the framework I've uh, proposed for, for mapping things that we sort of know online and offline, which would be to look separately at the uh, hyperscale or mass scale uh, of the internet or identity management, where we know that the internet doesn't really give you an identity, doesn't come from the identity layer, and therefore you have uh, anonymity and so forth. Uh, you have the cross-border effects, which in the case of platform regulation, as have been stated by the previous speakers, is a really stumb uh, strong stumbling block because you have a very hard time uh, forcing companies to do things where they don't have a a legal presence under your authority. Uh, barrier lowering, uh, friction reduction, uh, and all the memory effects. Uh, when I look at some of the uh, laws being proposed in many different countries to try to uh, modulate what happens over platforms, uh, I see them you know, unworkable uh, on, on any or all of uh, these criteria. And I think this is a, a useful framework to go forward. And finally, I would like to to put a very graphical example of what happens when you try really hard to control something that's so plastic, as Vittorio has uh, mentioned, and you know, there's lots of lobbying power, lots of technical power, lots of users uh, trying to do both good and bad things. If you try to, to control these things more and more by tightening your fist, it's like if you have to carry a small amount of water in your hand and you try to control it by, by, by squeezing it tight, it will spill all over. It's completely out of your control. And now you have... Uh, the energy you have, uh, and uh, that's probably one reason for to, to call for for caution, moderation, and uh, also uh, let's say technical awareness in proposing uh, forms of platform regulation that can actually uh, do the effects that you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, and also for a very rare moment of agreement between uh, Alejandro and Vittorio that those who are in intergovernance circle know happen once in a decade, so <laughs> very good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so let's now give the floor to uh, Shilpa uh, Singh that is, um, was previously at the Jindal Law School and now she's at the Melbourne University. Please, uh, Shilpa, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Luca and Yasmin and all the other panels. Uh, this has been a wonderful journey and I've I'm really enjoying being part of this forum. And first of all, I, I, I think for the past few days and even with today's panel, I've realized you know, the, the point of democracy and how platforms have been infringing this democratic process that we've been seeing uh, you know, for thousands of years and how it has been used as a tool, especially in authoritarian regime, to like, you know, make things much worse for people that are anyways living in hell. I really want... And, Surprisingly, I have been also thinking that's also been the core part of my research, and uh, which is why I want to start my presentation with like what what are the core values that we are here for and what we are trying to talk about and protect. I, I would like to say 
Yeah, some of the core values that I have identified as like autonomy, justice, fairness, justification, and freedoms that are guaranteed to all of us, especially right to privacy and right to vote. Uh, and I also want to like emphasize on Habermas's idea of deliberative democracy, uh, which he relies on the will of people and their ability to freely deliberate on a policy that that state comes up with, and especially on the policy when it constrains our rights. However, what we are seeing with these platforms is that you know they are in control of all our freedoms. They are constraining, but there is no process of deliberation. There is no justification, and that is the problem. And 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 for the past, I don't know, a decade or so, and especially in some of these international organizations, what we've been hearing is that you know, oh, data is the new oil, and we people are data miners. And I completely refuse to this argument. And uh, I, I actually see data as manifestation of our rights guaranteed to us, and especially freedom to uh, right to privacy. Uh, uh, and I, I'm also theorizing to the point that you know, right to privacy itself is a precondition to democracy and to all the other rights that we have. Uh, I, I quote this as an instance, like you know, especially when you cast your vote, right? You cast your vote behind a screen, because that's where you make your choice. And if that is revealed to the government, then of course there's going to be some sense of influence to make, uh, to change your opinion to your vote. Which is why I'd say that you know, privacy is a precondition to all the rights, especially right to vote. Uh, but what is happening right now? Like you know, all our data is being collected and it's behind this black box algorithm, which, which process, which they collect all the data, they process and then, and they process data, not individually, but in, in, in uh, of all our data together to basically profile and target advertise through which we are being sold like different kinds of services, products and goods, whatever. And that's the kind of business model they said there, you know, but you're getting the best if we do that, we are giving you personalized ben uh, services. But that is the problem. Uh, I was able to figure, I mean, I was tracing that, you know, when, when did it become such a problem that, you know, targeted advertising, when, when did it happen? Like, it was during the 70s and 80s that, you know, all these big corporates, you know, when they were not able to get as many consumers as they want. So what they did is that, you know, they just went around people and asked that, you know, what do you do in your life? They just start collect information. And then they realized, you know, once they, once they collect enough information about people, then they can realize, you know, what do people want? And then they can categorize their preferences. So after a few years, you know, there were behavioral economists who termed this, this called, uh, who termed this theory as revealed preference theory. And that's basically what platforms they use. They collect our data black and white every day of everything what we do, every movement we make of everything that, of everyone that is around us. And all they do is like profile us, they, tr they, 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 they track our preferences, and that's how you get your targets. Uh, and that's how you're, they are able to sell their products and services. Now what's worse that's happening is that, you know, it's also start to influence our opinions, our choices, the things that we'd never wanted in our, in our life are we are buying. The worst is that it's also influencing the fabric of democracy. We are seeing content, we are seeing misinformation, malinformation, which are flu uh, which are uh, uh, which which are making people to vote in a way probably they wouldn't know because they don't know where what is the right information or what is the source of right information these days. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Shilpa. Could um, you wrap up, wrap up? Sure. And I mean, just to just to talk about this, you know, I hope I don't have to talk about the evidences that have been that you know uh, Facebook has been doing. Uh, influencing elections. But as, as, as a result, as, as an outcome, I want to suggest that, you know, yes, and I'm, I'm from India, and again, we have like amazing IT rules and act. But then, you know, what I really want to talk about is like, you know, corporate culpability as a principle that has been uh, forwarded by some of the professors at, uh, at Australian University, especially Julie Powell's. And I would highly suggest that people should start reading about it, like, you know, uh, and Professor Ellis Bain and Jeannie Patterson, who's also my supervisor, and they're talking about like the intent, the, the, the like corporate culpability is like, you know, when we talk about corporate culpability and their intentions, we, like, like Monica just rightly said that, you know, all these procedures, they're not going to work, which is why we need to go step beyond that. What this theory suggests is that, you know, we need to assume that there is an intention 
because that that's how that's what their model is you know they work on the on this framework on the model that you know they are doing something bad and they know that you know if they continue doing that they can get out of it and they have been doing it all they get is like millions and millions of fines which they are able to pay off but then the intentionality doesn't change i guess this 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 i think i think this also makes job much easier for the regulators and the courts that you know because now we can assume intention the the the, the criminal intention or the criminal misconduct and then go ahead and uh, make claims against those uh, these kind of platforms so i guess i know there are several jurisdictional issues that you know because most of these firms are located in predominantly two jurisdictions in in, in on this planet but then it's, I think I think it's all about you know what do what do what do our states our governments want like you know once we do figure it out that you know we what we want to do what our visions are and and I think so it's that difficult to do to to use this kind of theories and go beyond what we actually have. Thank you. Thank you, Shirpa. Uh, yes, I think platform regulations. We really need to talk about platforms. They are the big techs. They have uh, a bigger GDP than most countries that they operate, so we need to al also to talk about competition law. But now I'd like to call Sophia Cheng from the Peking University. Uh, she's on Zoom with us. Hi, hi, yes, hi everyone. Um, I just finished my master's at Peking University. So I'm also a researcher with Yas and Luca in the Center of Technology and Society. And my, the focus of my research is very uh, into what China has been doing in terms of regulating digital technologies. So I'll, be try, I'll try to be really, really brief, touching upon the regulations or the provisions that China issued on um, algorithm recommendation management. And these have been uh, in effect since March last year. So we, have, uh, we were supposed to have already seen some changes and the three points that I want to make are about their provisions on what they call user rights protection or user empowerment, and also what the manage management obligations are supposed to be. So when you look at the provisions, they're very, very um, ambitious when they cover topics related to the protection of minors, the elderly, workers, consumers, saying that algorithms and all systems have to be designed con considering their limitations, and their needs so uh, fraud protection, especially considering the elderly population, workers, and uh, for especially those who work for these uh, apps, which, uh, for example, delivery apps, and are subject to algorithm recommendations, and also consumers, so to avoid uh, price discrimination and things that have already been covered somewhat in other legal provisions in the regulatory framework. So. Uh, they also try to cover, for example, fake news, but this goes into one of the challenging points that I want to um, highlight, because when you try to regulate based on a type of technology, so it's a uh, algorithm for recommendation, uh, it's very specific, it's not an umbrella term for AI, it's not a digital services, it's just the recommendation algorithms. And they go into the fake news because some algorithms, uh, they push this information in fake news, but they try to address that by stating that uh, the fake news matter is uh, to be dealt with where only people who have a service permit are supposed to provide internet news information. So when you start to analyze these matters from a perspective of uh, what is the the government type and things like that, it may become a, a challenging point when you think about protecting fundamental freedoms and human rights. And another point that I want to make is very similar to what Monica uh, mentioned, because uh, across the, the text of these provisions, you see oftentimes that um, the uh, company behind the algorithm must present information according to mainstream value orientations and prevent controversies or disputes. So when you think about that, what exactly is a mainstream value? What exactly is preventing controversies or disputes when these platforms, they want the users to engage in them and to spend more time in them and give their attention. So you want the people to be clicking and watching and reading. Are you actually like, uh, 
pushing forward the status quo of uh, political agenda or current society uh, values? Or are you just enabling tech companies to do what they're doing, but pushing so that um, a legal tax has covered and in the compliance department, they, they will tell you that, oh, we have these algorithms and these internal procedures to remove everything that may be controversial, but we don't necessarily know exactly what is controversial. So my, just to wrap up quickly here, my main concern when we're talking about platform regulation is trying to figure out, well, platforms are global, but um, governments and cultural values and notions of privacy and autonomy and freedom vary uh, in many different degrees across jurisdictions. So for example, when I was in China, I did not feel empowered at all by the apps that I was using because a lot of it for me was so confusing and visually polluted. But for my friends, they were very used to it and they said, oh, you can turn this off here and there. So how can we think of a regulatory framework that covers uh, uh, protection of freedoms and fundamental rights, but also consider that the nuances that come from different uh, cultural expectations and uh, governmental autonomy and sovereignty. Thank you for your time. Brilliant. Fantastic. So we have covered really an enormous set of uh, uh, opinions, critiques, suggestions. I know that there was a gentleman that had a, a, a question, so I think as we started with uh, some 10 minutes of delay and there is no other session upcoming, we can have maybe 5 to 10 minutes to complete uh, with a round of comments and questions, please. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Brook. I'm the chairman of the World Summit Awards and I have started in uh, Europe the data intelligence initiative and we are dealing uh, very much with uh, the data regulation side from data act uh, and uh, all the others one of the things which struck me in the presentation from monica but also now uh, from sophia and also from uh, other speakers is that i wonder if there is and if one can agree on on a hierarchy or prioritization of goals in terms of platform regulation because I think that what Monica was talking about was the environmental impact, uh, the, the labor exploitation behind it, and some, there are many other things. But uh, if you want to use, for instance, competition law, you are addressing something completely different. You are t addressing market power. And you think then if you're addressing market power, you maybe also get a regulation in place which then will uh, allow you to deal better with privacy issues and things like this. So I think that what would I would be interested in if a process like our consultation here in the IGF could not have as a deliverable at least a sketch or scaffolding of legal regulatory goals and then see what is the appropriate you know, main mechanism. And what I liked very much about so, uh, Sophia's uh, last points is that uh, the idea that there's a universality of regulations you know, uh, might be also something which uh, has a colonialist as aspect to it. You know? And I think, therefore, one has to be seeing, OK, what are the principles, and then what are the implementations and things like this. So I would be really interested if there's work done on this, or if people here in this room and others uh, who are associated with it uh, would be interested in engaging in something like this because I would be. Thank you. I see we have also a comment from uh, Anita and when she gets the mic let me just say that uh, it is an excellent suggestion to actually to for the next year of work to have to have a compilation of on not only of what exists but of what should be taken into consideration because the example of uh, for instance labor rights being completely disconsidered is something that we have been discussing a lot in terms of, for instance, content moderation. It's easy to say we have content moderation has to be human, but then you have you really are condemning people to be traumatized for life because they have to moderate what a lot of very special characters share on social media. So it's uh, it, that is very, very much something that is totally disconsidered by regulatory debates, but is key. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, I think uh, it's a very important point, but I I also feel that there is a um, another dimension to thinking about uh, common benchmarks. 
I think that pertains to the subsidiarity of most international legal regimes to the economic uh, legal regime, which you know, de facto means that um, we are not able to pay attention as domestic economies. And I think uh, the last presenter was talking about the fact that, you know, demonizing any nation doesn't get, uh, get us very far because there are cultural nuances to the way in which people think. And democracy is indeed, you know, as hyper-local as we can take it to be, you know, and how between uh, the granular and scale we are able to have a conversation. The reason I say that is um, oftentimes the capacity of developing countries to even regulate for labor standards is contingent on the way in which they get caught in extremely adversarial, adverse, not adversarial, adverse trade conditions, trade terms and conditions. So I think conditions of labor should be not regulated through platform regulation, but through the ILO. Or environmental law should be regulated through maybe the Biodiversity Convention and other protocols. So we should simply not do this forum shopping because what is to be established here is that the supremacy of the uh, global economy, which seems to serve certain nations within international regimes, that is to be challenged. So if we seek to regulate platforms by saying everyone has a uniform platform regulation with a common minimum standard, then we will simply you know, uh, arm twist certain countries into adopting regulation that they then cannot domestically govern. I just want to quickly, I don't know, uh, quickly point out that, you know, I don't know about respect to protecting environmental regulations, but in Kenya, uh, in the month of February, so there are, uh, I think, I think Facebook content moderators, they have like a big set of people who work as content moderators. And because of the, the horrible working conditions they were working, I think they have long hours and the kind of content they have to go through day and night, it was horrifying. So. And and they put up their issues before Facebook, which Facebook refused to listen to them. So now they are going ahead before the labor their labor commissioner as a class action suit. I think it's one of its kind suit, and a lot of different countries now following up that you know, okay, something like this is able to happen. And be on the jury on the on the competition part. I mean, uh, just to. Uh, give you a bit of idea that you know the the entire debate of data protection actually started with competition regime uh, and and now what we have is that you know we have created like different paths of like you know how to deal this kind of a problem and now we are ending up in a different kind of problem that you know if it is data and privacy you cannot go before competition authorities however like recently german uh, german competition authorities they have taken up privacy claim as, I mean, like how uh, these big platforms are abusing people's privacy and that has become, and, and that's how they're abusing their power to force people to give up their privacy. So I guess, you know, some of these buckets are now going away and all these divisions are being removed. So I think, I think uh, like I said, it's, it's about the vision and what the state really wants to do, but it's, but it's not like it's impossible, but you know, how we interpret these laws, like, you know, we really don't need to see in laws like black and white, but you know, we really need to go beyond the words of them as like, you know, see what is the purpose and intention behind these laws, I guess. We have a last, a very last comment, and then oh, we will okay. wrap up. So, um, I was working for uh, vendor management at Google between 2017 and 19. We call them TVCs, temporary vendors and contractors. So my only point will be that, so actually making sure that the conditions of these workers are humane, uh, it kind of goes through managing the trust and safety teams and making sure that their management involves certain standards, which is this very uh, micro corporate level management detail, which is usually not the government don't have the tools or understanding to actually dictate how that team should work. And my second point would be uh, when we're talking about how governments regulate technology companies, I should, we should also come up with the framework and terminology to name and address when big tech uh, cooperates with governments in the behind, from the back line. Uh, sometimes authoritarian governments, sometimes there are demands which do not go through the official trust and safety or official mechanisms of big tech companies in terms of content moderation. So uh, if we start talking about, if we maybe name that, it, that's not regulation, that's something else. That's, um, that's an, an official 
uh, thing that really harms uh, the citizen at that point. I think that will be helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to make like a really small remark on Anita's uh, comments. Uh, our framework for this year, in spite of having an like, international law approach, we try to uh, make it not uh, universe from a universalist perspective. We are also drafting uh, it from a relat relativist approach. Human rights need to be also uh, criticized, we have to, sorry, we have to have a, a critici criticism perspective on human rights, because of course it can be uh, ideologically uh, dominant, dom dominated by uh, the rich uh, countries. Uh, like we are from global south countries and we know that this uh, hegemony of the ideas can be uh, really used as we weaponized against uh, our sovereignty, really. So, yeah, just uh, this is small remark. Okay, I think we have covered a, a very extensive uh, uh, range of issues, probably <laughs> almost any kind of issue we could cover uh, in 90 minutes. I would like to thank very much all the panelists for the excellent presentation and the participants for the excellent comments because we have also had some very uh, interesting remarks and ideas for uh, more work. Uh, so I will uh, suggest if you are interested in, in uh, reading this document to go on the web page of the Coalition on Platform Responsibility and download it. It's for free for everyone. Share it if, and give feedback if you want. And uh, we will meet you next year for, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Coalition. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>